phone is me. <laughs> <laughs> Hola, Jessica and Jan in one in one plan. We need like a double picture. Um, but yeah, we we help bring the phage community together to try to help accelerate this field and help connect people when they need phages with those who have them. And then Jean Paul. Hello, I'm Jean-Paul Pionnet, uh, doing phage therapy research in Brussels, in the military hospital, also trying to get phages to the patient. <laughs> and then today we have Rob Levine. Hi, good evening. Uh, my name is Rob. Uh, I'm also in uh, Belgium doing uh, molecular microbiological research on phages, and uh, we try to uh, think of new ways how phages can in inspire uh, antimicrobials. And then my name is Adriana. I recently defended, not so recently, but kind of recently defended my PhD from the tech, from the Center for Phage Technology at Texas A&M. And now I'm here at Evergreen for a little bit. Um, and today we're going to end up talking. There's So Rob has done a bunch of work a lot of work that has been published but i think we should focus today on these this idea of finding new genes that stop being hypothetical genes in the large phage genomes and they do end up doing something in the bacteria and we never know what and this comes about from your recent paper so you want to talk to us a little bit about your idea of finding these functions for hypothetical proteins that we all see in our phage genomes? Yeah, sure. Uh, so, so this is a topic we've been working on for, for many years, over a decade, really uh, analyzing phages and, and then indeed trying to move forward on, on trying to identify all of these unknown orphans. And uh, although our initial interest is, is purely scientific and trying to understand the, the phage biology of how these small proteins uh, influence the bacterial metabolism, uh, a few, uh, for us, obvious uh, things can, can be derived from it. Uh, the, the billions of years of, of evolution between bacteria and phage means that within a few minutes, uh, these phages are able to, to engineer the entire bacterial metabolism into a phage-producing machine. And uh, being able to do so requires very highly tailored and, and specific processes that, that need to be blocked, that need to be activated, and, and that are generally going to, to impact the metabolism. So, so if you zoom in on, on specific phage proteins that are going to inhibit, for example, the DNA gyrase of, of the bacteria to, to, to lock that down uh, and, and block uh, uh, bacterial replication, uh, that's one way it makes phage infection more more efficient. Uh, but if you want to, to capture on this, uh, it also means that through these billions of years of evolution, the phage has found what we consider the most efficient way to do that. So uh, if, if that bacterial target is, is also a useful target to use for antibiotics design, it also means that these small phage uh, proteins that are inhibiting them uh, it can inspire the way to, to find new small molecules that, that uh, bind and inhibit at the most critical points uh, within that bacterial metabolism. That, that's uh, sort of the, the idea. Um, well, I also want to point out that every time we look at bacteriophage interaction, some new tool comes out. The first tool that ever came out that we all use is restriction enzymes. And then now CRISPRs are the new super tool of looking at bacteriophage interactions with fate, with their host. And then, um, I don't know, maybe we, maybe we can find new tools as well with these yeah, new uh, things that we haven't looked at. Absolutely. Yeah. So the, the phage proteins themselves or, or circuits can be used to, to direct or redirect and not, not only destroy or, or, or kill or block. Uh, so, yeah, the, these kinds of tools, whether they be proteins, whether they're uh, new circuits, uh, you mentioned the restriction enzymes, but 
if you consider uh, the PET expression system uh, using the T7 RNA polymerase, uh, T7 lysozyme to, to regulate recombinant expression in E. coli, I mean, yeah, uh, uh, repressors that, that can be used and, and used in, in circuits as well. So, yeah, these are also biotechnological tools that, that can be derived and, and used uh, directly uh, besides uh, the, the antibacterials, let's say. Uh, you, I, might I also think a new, you might end up creating a new biotech company, Rob. Yeah, who knows? <laughs> no. <laughs> Uh, yeah, um, uh, yeah, but uh, I, I lost my thread there for a second. So. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, no, no problem, no problem. Uh, but uh, the, the the main constraint that we're seeing uh, it's it's all and well to ha to have this nice inhibitory phage protein, uh, but obviously you can't add this from from the outside to a bacteria. Uh, so on one hand, these these phage proteins, if if people are thinking about engineering phages or or just using uh, phages as a delivery vessel for uh, other coding sequences like CRISPR and so forth, yeah, there are other phage orbs that that can be highly specific and highly tailored to to uh, be be a cargo in these uh, synthetic phages. Uh, but yeah, from a, a traditional antibiotics point of view, uh, finding such a phage protein is, is only the first step. And then you need structural information and how uh, small molecules will, will that, that do penetrate the cell will, will mimic that activity of, of the phage protein and, and target those uh, hotspots within the bacteria. This is super cool. So we want to we wanna go then over how did you go to... Let's let's start from why look at the specific phage that you were looking at. It's a Pseudomonas phage, less twenty four. Yeah. Yeah, well, it, it's not all that. That has a long history, and it's good Jean Paul is here because we have been collaborating for uh, fifteen years, uh, I think now. And uh, initially, uh, we were interested in in phage biology, and and we sort of. Uh, from an applied perspective, uh, came up with with uh, Pseudomonas as as an interesting uh, pathogen and and uh, that that needed alternatives. So it was actually Jean Paul who also put us in the direction of uh, uh, starting my PhD work. Let's say to 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 focus on uh, Pseudomonas phages. Uh, which was the right decision, and and over the years with Peter Jan Sass uh, as my PhD student, we we captured actually the diversity of of the lytic uh, phages impacting Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and uh, yeah, just like in the past where you had a had the T, T set of phages, a, a limited set of phages that was being studied by the entire community, we've also defined sort of a a limited set of representatives of, of this diversity of pseudomonas phages to, to study. So all of our LUS phages and LUS24, LUS19, FICAZ, uh, the, uh, for, and these are sort of our, our type phages in the lab where all of our uh, research uh, in, in pseudomonas is, is focused on. Uh, and yeah, that's, that's, that's the history behind that, let's say. And uh, yeah, dealing with those early phage proteins was was just a matter of, of curiosity. What are they doing? What are they for? And and it, uh, to be honest, it, it's it's very uh, challenging and, and difficult research. Uh, like the, like this story, I I, I think it, it took us twelve years to to get to the understanding for for this one phage or uh, what it's actually for. Uh, sometimes it goes easy. Sometimes. Uh, it's more difficult, uh, so yeah, that that that's the challenge, um, and and you start yeah from scratch because homology is not there. That they're truly orphans. There is no functional clue whatsoever. I think uh, the alpha folds that has now been uh, become publicly available, uh, which we're implementing now, is is something we're 
systematically going to start using to, to try and get any functional clue from those predicted structures that, that will guide us and, and provide first hypothesis that, that can help guide our experimental work to prove uh, the function of, of uh, those orphans. That's super cool. So for those who have or have not looked at the paper, um, the, the, whole, the cool idea, he presents in the paper a predicted structure that I find super, super cool because it's a beta sheet with the whole helix. And it's very interesting the way it might actually be toxic for, well, it actually was toxic for the cell. So you want to, like, do you want to give us an overview of how you went about for those who may not have looked at the paper? Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, so uh, historically, we, we actually took uh, two approaches to, to find uh, toxic phage ORFs uh, that are uh, specifically inhibiting a certain target. Uh, one way is to just uh, clone and express all of these unknown phage proteins, uh, express them as, as a single copy in, in the host, so in Pseudomonas, and seeing which were inhibiting growth and, and looking under the microscope. So that, that was for us a first selection uh, criterion. Mm -hmm. And uh, for this protein, we, we actually saw when we took it out of the phage context and just simply express it as a single gene in Pseudomonas, that it actually was causing filamentous growth in the bacteria, which either means uh, that it's uh, influencing the cell wall in a way or uh, uh, messing with the uh, DNA replication. And uh, by using a pull-down experiment, uh, pull-down uh, assays uh, where you uh, take your recombinant phage protein and, and, and uh, put uh, pseudomonas lysate over a column. Uh, if, if you pull out an interaction partner, uh, you can verify that in various ways. And in this way, uh, pu pushing over the entire lysate of pseudomonas on, onto this column loaded with the phage protein revealed uh, the DNA gyrase as a candidate interactor. And uh, this was subsequently uh, followed up with uh, other uh, protein interaction approaches, including uh, bacterial to hybrid, which specifically allowed us to zoom in on the uh, specific interaction domain uh, the phage protein was uh, targeting uh, in this complex, the DNA gyrase P. Uh, and no. yeah, so that that's one approach. Uh, the, the the other approach we've used in the past is say, in general, Pseudomonas has some key uh, hubs, let's say, of of protein complexes. Uh, you can consider the DNA polymerase, the RNA polymerase, uh, the RNA degradosome. So so key protein complexes that govern uh, the metabolism of the bacterial cell. By tagging those uh, and, and seeing which phage proteins bind to it, uh, that, that was another approach we, we tried to use to uh, identify these, these interactions at, at a molecular level. That's well, it was very lucky that you were, uh, you were able to observe a phenotype because a bunch of times what you get is dead cells and not really a phenotype after after expressing the protein. That was... That well, was uh, well we, 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 we use an inducible system. Eh? So once we add the IPPG, uh, this triggers the expression of, of the phage protein. And from all of the early phage genes we, we cloned and expressed, uh, about 10% of them was uh, toxic. And, and you were you're able to, uh, with our collaborator, Abram Artsen at, at TU Leuven, who was uh, a specialist in, in microscopy, we were able to yeah, track those single cells and micro colonies to see whether they were developing normally or, or not. Um, yeah. But yeah, a lot of toxic proteins are, are there among those early genes, uh, the first ones that, that are expressed. Uh, so, okay, I'm going to ask a naive question. Do you call the peptide IGY or Iggy? Iggy. <laughs> Yay. Yes. Okay. So I like Iggy better. <laughs> okay. So Iggy is a very interesting peptide because as you mentioned, it inhibits 
DNA gyrase. And it was, so, so the experiments that you did for specific domain binding were super cool in terms of like your bacterial true hybrid. I, I wanted to, to ask or more of a generic question on the bacterial true hybrid is, did you actually find interacting domains and how did you do that? Yeah, so uh, actually the, the bacterial two hybrids uh, for us, most of the time, oh, hello? Hello. Ah, yeah, yeah, sorry, I thought I, I, I was out. Uh, so, so finding the interaction, we use other techniques, uh, like I mentioned the pull downs and, and so forth. So the bacterial two hybrids we use to find a direct interaction between candidates of proteins we think are interacting. So uh, the way the, the bacterial to hybrid works is that uh, if two proteins interact with each other uh, within the bacterial cell, they reconstitute an enzyme uh, that, that triggers a, a reporter gene. And in this way, uh, expression of the reporter gene is indicative of a protein interaction, in this case between gyrase B and uh, Iggy. And uh, it doesn't have to be a full protein. So uh, first we did gyrase B, but you, you can also take subdomains as, as long as they're in frame uh, to, to find yeah, uh, which subdomain within the protein is, is uh, interacting if that makes sense. It does, does, it does make sense. By the way, I, as, I, as I've mentioned before, uh, please come up, raise your hand and ask, ask questions. As you already know, I talk a lot and I end up asking a bunch of questions, but please, please do come up, ask questions. And if you don't want to come up and ask questions yourselves, there is this little paper airplane that Sabrina said it was a narrow but it's a paper airplane on the side you can message either one of us up here and we can read your questions i i have a question um oh someone wants to come up hold on justin hi, nice to hear Hello. you i'll save my question hi justin hi um can you guys hear me sure um, so this is great work, but full disclosure, I haven't read the paper, but I was curious, how many of these proteins are targeting the host bacteria, and how many do you think could be targeting other competing bacteria? Like, have you tested these lysates against you know, other gram positives or different types of bacteria that aren't the host? So the, the bacteriophage could, in theory, be producing things that are helping or, just, or destroying the, the, competi the competing bacteria, not just... Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so uh, uh, first off, I, I should mention that most phages we're working with are strictly lytic phages. So they don't go into a symbiosis uh, with uh, the host usually. And uh, often the, the reason why these early phage proteins are, are unknown is because they're so specific. <clears throat> they are specifically aimed after the DNA is injected within the first two minutes to, to convert the bacterial metabolism, and that usually makes them highly specific. Uh, in our case, if we have a toxic phage protein in the hosts, uh, for us it's Pseudomonas aeruginosa, we'll test a few strains of uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa and express it in there. We maybe take uh, Pseudomonas putida and then express it also in E. coli to test the range of uh, toxicity, let's say. And, and we have a, a number of examples that are specifically toxic to uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa alone, whereas other examples are actually toxic across the board, um, but I, I would assume limited to, to gram-negative bacteria. But those are at least covering... Pseudomonas and E. coli uh, in terms of activity range or, or being toxic. And I think this is a, a key element because it would allow you, uh, depending on the interaction, to, to design antimicrobials that are highly specific uh, to the species you're targeting or could have a broader host range uh, within the gram-negative realm. Thank you. 
if that answers uh, your question. It, 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 I'm just in love with these weird symbiotic relationships between phages and bacteria. And when I think about Pseudomonas living there, there's other bacteria out there that the phage would have an interest in destroying. And it would be really cool if you happen to stumble on one that doesn't kill Pseudomonas, but kills its neighbor. That's all. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, obviously in, in prophages there are examples uh, where prophages actually encode virulence factors that, that give positive traits to uh, the bacterial cell, making it more effective to, to, to human cells or uh, potentially could, could target. Uh, uh, you also have to keep in mind that uh, there are these uh, phage, de phage tail derived proteins, uh, these uh, the, uh, type of secretion systems that are basically uh, phage tails that are being shot out uh, of the bacterial cell that's producing them and is going to, to rupture other cells uh, in, the, in the vicinity. Um, if, if you've heard of those. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. I don't want to take too much more time. Thank you. <laughs> that's fine. Fazal, welcome. You have a question? But you're muted still, Fazal. I th you need to press the microphone on the side at the at the bottom of your screen on the side so that you can uh, speak. No. Nope. nope. We don't hear you, Fazal. Meanwhile, Sabrina, you had a question before somebody else. Before I don't who's going to come up. Oh, oh, wait, it's going to come up. But you have a question. Go ahead. <laughs> okay, I'll just say my question. Um, so I was curious, um, it, the peptide inhibits gyrase, is this a, a common mechanism with phage that they inhibit a DNA gyrase for replication? Uh, I, I don't think it's a common mechanism. Uh, I think every, basically my personal belief, but that's in the general cells is any mechanism that's that's worthwhile to the phage will be targeted. Uh, uh, we we now have examples uh, in this case of the DNA gyrase uh, MVAT, which was involved in, in uh, cell division. Uh, we have an example of a phage protein that that's blocking the uh, degrade natural degradation of RNA molecules. So. Uh, the, the, the variation is huge and, and it's really tackling every aspect of replication, transcription, translation and even post-translational processes uh, all to fine-tune and, and, and optimize. But to say that every phage will have a gyrase inhibitor, no. Uh, it, it depends on, on how it's uh, served and, and used. Okay, thank you. Always, you have a question. Welcome up. Thank you, Adriana. Um, thank you all for holding this space. So, um, you know, I'll be very honest. I I'm very into, you know, phages that are commercially available in the U.S. that we can use in um, clinical practice. I kind of, so I'm a health practitioner, I work a lot on the gut microbiome, and um, yeah, and I, I don't want to take away from the conversation if uh, if that a question related to something like that would not be okay, but I just had a question in the area of, um, so I've been curious, I, I use certain phages um, with certain types of probiotics, and obviously it has a really profound effect, a multiplier effect that uh, clinicians are very well aware of and um, it's very good for patients or clients that have been on antibiotics for very long periods of time and need a stronger gut restoration and you know I'll see some incredible things since I've incorporated uh, phage therapy and I've always been curious like so spore uh, spore based uh, organisms Soil spore-based organisms have very strong survivability. Combining those with um, phages, 
what would be the efficacy of that? Would that be something safe? Has the research shown anything like that? And uh, my apologies if this question is like outside of yeah, it, context. It's, or so. it, it's, it's a good question. Uh, uh, we, with, with another colleague, we've, we've uh, briefly looked at this. Uh, you have to realize that in general, spore-forming bacteria in the spore form are, are not metabolically active. Uh, so generally, and, and in addition, uh, introduces uh, a lot of changes, uh, obviously, in the bacterial cell wall uh, that prevents uh, phages uh, from, from infecting in a natural way. Uh, I, I could imagine, or I would hope, that there is a phage out there that uh, has the enzymes on its tail to penetrate the uh, shell of the spore, and, and after infection will will awaken the bacterial metabolism. But I haven't seen any uh, examples of that actually existing. But uh, I think it's an interesting idea uh, for sure to, to hunt for that. And I also like the idea that, that you're proposing to combine uh, probiotics with uh, phages, I think is very smart. Uh, the phages are specific, targeting only uh, the pathogen you envision and your probiotics will uh, much more quickly take over the, uh, the the space or the niche that's created by, by lysing the bad guys. Thank you, Rob. That is, that's very interesting and it's a very helpful way to think about it. Um, yeah, I, I guess the, the cell wall, like you explained, for the spores um, is going to be, it's going to have, it's going to be thicker so yeah that's a really interesting way but, to think about but, it but yeah but i mean it it has to exist right because if spores are the for a certain species the most uh prominent uh, lifestyle or, or if 90 percent of of the time uh, a certain bacteria is in a spore form yeah phages through billions of years of coevolution need to have evolved ways to yeah still target those and, and activate them. But, yeah, I, I don't think there is a lot of uh, published work on this. Uh, yeah. Gotcha. That's, that's interesting, and it just helps me think through the... Uh, I was concerned about a safety element just because, like, for example, you know, now Acromensia is available commercially um, as a probiotic therapeutic agent and um, in the U.S., it wasn't available previously, and then when you're combining, when you see this multiplier effect, and I've seen a lot of research looking at this, um, I was concerned that we could have too much imbalance, right? Like, you can't have too much acromensia versus other strains in the gut, and uh, but we want a good amount of acromensia, but once it gets overgrown, that's how we use the term overgrowth, and I was concerned about that with the spores, but I think what you're saying um, helps me think about it in a different way. The, the beef I have with uh, probiotics, as, as they're defined by some, is that, and now we're all the way away from phages, is that, is that some uh, will actually be uh, producing secondary metabolites, will actually be probiotics producing antibiotics, uh, and I'm, uh, that, that kill other bacteria. And yeah, I'm not convinced that's the way to go for for me, a probiotic, a good probiotic, is a commensal that takes over or restores the natural flora, rather than a probiotic that's producing uh, some weird, unknown or uncharacterized antibiotic, uh, of which we know nothing about. Correct. So, Fazal, you're up. Can you now? Can you unmute yourself? Can you find? Did you find that? the mic to the right of your screen, bottom right. You can also message me on Facebook or Twitter and I can ask the question. Or here with using back channel, you can also message people with the little arrow on the side. Hmm. Meanwhile, does anybody have any more questions? There. Justin. 
I feel like this is maybe an exercise in digressions here, but the, I know you guys are looking for antimicrobials, but the faith could potentially be doing a lot of very interesting things. Um, like, uh, can you comment like on codon usage and optimization, or how the faith could be changing metabolism to produce proteins or nucleic acids, or any of that sort of thing? Like, there's a lot of potentially really useful stuff in this. Yeah, it's, it's, it's all it's all happening. It's all happening. Uh, um, uh, definitely. Uh, so it's not simply a matter of these early phage proteins inhibiting stuff. Uh, we, we initially looked at those ten percent of, of toxic ones. We're now moving, and since we have all these constructs, if if they're influencing any other type of phenotype uh, that that might. In, uh, influence biofilm formation or, or indeed will result in a higher potency of, of growth or, or whatever. Uh, and yeah, I, I think, yeah, uh, it's very difficult to, to fully understand, but... Uh, uh, well, you yeah, can't the, say everything, but it's all potentially very useful, even like something that upregulates tryptophan. You know, who cares? Just for an example. And yep. It, it is... That would be a very useful enzyme for certain applications. Mm -hmm. So there's there's a sure, gold mine yes, here, but it doesn't uh, work to find it all. Yeah, uh, exactly. And 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 I have a, a grant uh, from the EU, uh, an ERC grant, and and that goes directly into this. Not trying to kill the bacteria, but try to harvest uh, phage proteins and, and circuits. Uh, to, to rebuild Pseudomonas and have it do what we want it to do. Great. Tell them to give you more money. Great stuff. <laughs> no, it's okay. <laughs> I have an echo. Uh, sorry. Yeah. <coughs> now, it, let's see if, if, if Fazal is able to unmute. If not, let's go to Omer. Um, hello, Mr. Fari. Could you hear it? And it is... Uh, uh, the, the, the clubhouse has been some using uh, club, uh, VPN. It's uh, sometimes uh, making issue. But Mr. Wall, I have just one question that you're talking about that uh, page is some like in your during your conversation, you mentioned that uh, some pages protein are toxic to bacteria and uh, we are. Around, we are, we are, personally, I cloned the, the whole gene of the bacteria page of the Sinotopic Victor Bomeni. I clone it in the uh, in the Victor PT twenty eight A and try to express it in the E. coli PL twenty one, but I am unable to express it. I try different condition. So please, can you say? Just that what will be the possible reason, like holine gene may be the toxic part bacteria. So how I can express yeah. this holine gene in bacteria? Thank you very yeah, much, Professor. That, that's a very difficult one. So, so the whole in gene is, is not an early gene. It, its role is actually to, to pen, penetrate the cytoplasmic membrane to, to allow the endolysin to gain access uh, to the peptidoglycan. Uh, so if, if you look at the biological function of the whole in, it's actually uh, in, inserting inside the cytoplasmic membrane and and that on its own can be toxic so uh, expressing holins uh, is the most difficult thing uh, to do and and uh, we, we uh, together when Yves Briers was a PhD student in my lab uh, he, he focused some time on this uh, uh, without great success, I must add. Uh, I think uh, one of the key things to try is to have a really bulky protein on the end terminus, like maltose binding protein or thyroidoxin, and cr create a fusion protein uh, that may be more stable and may be less toxic for the E. coli cell. Uh, I think that's one way to go. Uh, another way to go is to realize that it's toxic and, and uh, create a fermentation culture in which you only induce uh, at a very late stage. So there is already a lot of uh, E. coli biomass. Uh, and if you induce then and for a short time, you have a short window in which you express your toxic protein. But hopefully because you have a lot of cells, you will get uh, the protein. But uh, the first thing I would suggest is to create a fusion protein 
where uh, after uh, purification you can cleave off the uh, the bulky uh, interaction uh, protein. So if I may interject here, because we've done it in the CPT multiple times with different types of holins, in the case of lambda, with, with lambda holin, that, that's kind of the staple of, of the young lab at Center for Phage Technology. So um, what you first need to figure out is a way to have a very, very tight control of expression. So anything that is inducible with IPTG won't work because there's leaky expression and if you don't have a good uh, control uh, you are, or a good promoter with a good control and if it's, be it's better if it's the native promoter or a promoter that will um, have your cells expressing very little protein, then you won't have any protein to get because it's going to be very toxic to the cell. And the other suggestion that Rob had, which is grow the cells at a higher OD so that when you induce, you're inducing more cells. And so it's it's a matter of there's, there's various media that will help you increase the um, bacterial growth um, that will allow you to express proteins with a higher OD. Yeah. I fully agree, Andrea. I will follow your expert suggestions. Jean-Paul, you were going to say something? Yeah. yeah, well, this can be a bit naive, but could you try, like, a cell-free uh, system? Cell-free... Uh... It's crappy because this is a membrane protein. It needs to be... So it, 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 it will fold correctly once it, it's kind of docked in the membrane. So it, I don't know that cell-free systems work that well. Well, you, 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 yeah, okay, it would be like a homemade one. Huh? You, you could maybe add some uh, membrane uh, fragments and things like that. I, ha yeah. I actually haven't tried that. Maybe with membrane vesicles, you look at that. That's a possibility. I have no yeah, idea. Yeah, and there's now, now these small uh, proteinaceous discs that have a, a, a membrane bilayer in there that's sometimes used help purify phage pro uh, to, to help uh, purify uh, membrane proteins but we've never used it or, or tried it i haven't tried it either so i can't attest to that we can go with omer if i'm pronouncing this correctly please <laughs> omer you can unmute yourself and ask your question oh no Maybe then let's go with Varun. Yeah. Hi, Varun. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Yeah, hi. So, like, I was uh, uh, trying to answer Pezza's, uh, like, question. I want to, like, agree with uh, uh, Professor Rob that, uh, yeah, I, I am working, since I am also working with the mycobacteriophage D29 pollen protein. So, that's my PhD work. So, I also observed that uh, if I add some uh, bulky group, to the end terminal like even if i had gfp so then toxicity is reduced uh, at end terminal and uh, c terminal tagging with gfp does not make very much difference so yeah uh, that that idea would work uh, best out of like others so it will reduce the toxicity of pollen so that might work yeah so just i wanted to add. and and you're you're doing this in myco bacteria mycobacterium yeah, mycobacterium. So the D29 is the phage, and we are expressing it in uh, smegmatis. Mm -hmm. yeah. Nice. So we tried that. Yeah. Thank you. That's a tough bacterium to work with. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Days and days and months and months of growth. Yay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so I do smegmatis. Smegmatis is it grows faster, but still. Mycobacteria takes forever compared to anything else. I'm going to move Omer to audience and then I'm going to ask that he comes back. Yeah. There. You can raise your hand again, Omer, and then come back up so that you can ask your question. Varun. Yeah, uh, so uh, I had another question, like, uh, maybe I missed, but 
I, I was thinking in this uh, similar aspect regarding Mycobacteriophage D29 and the host uh, tuberculosis mycomatis, the interaction between the phase proteins and the host proteins which are inhibiting. So, like, at uh, very first, how can I, uh, like, uh, uh, predict that uh, this could be the uh, difficult, uh, uh, like, this could be the protein which, uh, which is uh, inhibiting the host growth. Right. So there are certain proteins uh, in which my another lab member is working from D20 is like uh, GP uh, 40, 43 and 36. Uh, those are uh, those have possible DNA binding sites in them. Uh, yeah. uh, like uh, as prediction from the uh, uh, bioinformatics analysis and uh, like those are when he expressed that in uh, microvitrans mycomatis that is actually inhibiting the growth. So basically what she is trying to do is that she is trying to find out the uh, interaction with some other host protein. So, uh, like, um, that, that's very interesting. I, I think in general, yeah, you're lucky to have two clue, basically a clue that it might be binding to uh, nucleic acids, which, which is interesting. Uh, generally, how, how to define uh, the early proteins is actually by often uh, the easiest by, by exclusion. I, I think the structural proteins are easily identified, uh, DNA polymerase and, and DNA polymerase genes are, are easily identified. So <laughs> based on, on those annotations uh, and, and if you have an overall view of the genome architecture, it allows you to bioinformatically zoom in or predict what are the early phage proteins and, and those are the ones you want to uh, focus on in general. Uh, when, when we started doing that a long time ago, systematically, that, that's how we did it. Uh, we chose proteins smaller than 250 amino acids that were, let's say, in the beginning of the genome and the first to be injected. And, and that's how we selected uh, potential candidates uh, to start screening for. Uh, nowadays, uh, we're, we're moving more and more also to RNA sequencing of the infection process. And, and then you're actually seeing what are the first genes that are transcribed. And those would be your initial candidates as... Uh, uh, modulators of, of the bacterial metabolism. Yeah, that's correct. Uh, but uh, these proteins are like very small in size, around 11 yes. and yes. uh, that is yeah. even less. Yeah. So, it, and nothing is known about this candidate protein. So, it is like a bit challenging regarding finding out yeah. what the exact role. Yeah. So my first suggestion now would be to, and there are now, uh, with the alpha folds, uh, there are now structural predictions that you can make, which in turn can help give you functional clues. Uh, and this is now very easy. I think uh, there is a website where you can input the sequence of, of your uh, phage protein and, and then it will uh, run its uh, AI prediction model. And if you're lucky, you may get a functional clue that can help guide uh, uh, experiments downstream. But uh, in general, uh, what is your phage protein going to do? It's either going to bind nucleic acids or it's going to bind a protein. And, and 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 that's basically uh, the first triage that, that 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 needs to be made when you're uh, uh, trying to to ascertain the function. But yeah, a lot of luck is involved in in yeah finding the the actual uh, function and and yeah. making it work. Yeah. Thank you. Are those two f f proteins also toxic in smegmatis? Yes, yes, in smegmatis only, uh, those are toxic. Okay. And so, yeah, they, she tries, she's trying to do some pull down assay, but she's not getting enough quantity so that she can perform that mass spec analysis. Yeah. Kind of it's the interacting partner. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Cross linking studies and then pull down. Cross linking, we've, we've never done, but but it's certainly advisable, I would say. Uh, 
if if the access is there. Uh, we've had our best luck in in putting the phage protein on a column uh, and then pushing through uh, lysate and and in that way uh, finding an interaction partner. Thank you. But yeah, the, 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 the problem is there is no ideal protein interaction technique. Uh, there is a lot of false positive, a lot of false negative results yes. that can come from it. So yeah, it, it's, it, yeah, you're lucky if, yeah, yeah. if one out of five uh, is actually yielding the protein interaction uh, data that, that uh, you're looking for. Well, you kind of mentioned it like a few minutes ago, but I want to go, I want to um, ask more specifically about AlphaFold and these prediction softwares that you are, that you can install. How that, how has that changed your uh, research in terms of looking for new proteins? Have you found any, is there, are, you, are there any possible predictions that can help uh, has, has the refinement of the predictions and the structures actually given people more clue as to what phage proteins do? Yeah, not not yet with us. I mean, but it's too early. It's it's only yeah. We're, we're installing it now. We're we're for the moment just doing a few phage proteins and and seeing what their structure is, but nothing groundbreaking. But I mean. I, I assume that, I mean, yeah, it has to give us some clues, right? In any case, it's going to be better than whatever BLAST or HHPRET or HAMMER is going to give you in terms of functional clues. It's, it's just another tool in the arsenal, and, and it should be the most valuable, uh, theoretically speaking, uh, because the, there is no sequence homology, uh, but yeah, the, there's always a bigger chance that there will be uh, structural homology, and and this is truly the first tool that that uh, provides this. And yeah, so it almost has to give something. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's my, my, my take on this is that it still depends on what you find in databases, and there's not a lot of phage proteins that are that have been solved in databases. That's why I was asking specifically if the if it has like if if you have found something that increases no, no, at least we, prediction we, for phages. We, we haven't found anything yet, but there are bacterial proteins in databases and, and structures available. And I mean, uh, in view of the close relationship between phages and their host, if that means that I'm, or I'm hoping that the AI, by uh, learning from uh, bacterial proteins, uh, will, will also support... Uh, viral or, or phage proteins in, in their structural prediction. Well, now that you're installing it, you can teach us all because I, I'm, I'm hopeful, but I am skeptical. Well, uh, I, I, uh, installing it, it yeah, that, that's, uh, we will see how that goes. But in any case, as I understand it from my people, it's, it's now a matter of just like you would do for a blast, inputting uh, your protein sequence and then waiting for half an hour or two hours, depending on, on uh, which algorithm you use and, and see what the output is. And the output is then a PDB file uh, for which you can start seeing if, if there is any uh, functional clues uh, uh, yeah, or uh, structural conserved uh, things domains. to known, to known <laughs> domains or, or functions. This is okay. This is cool. Thank you so much. Is there anybody else that has more questions? Because, as I said, I speak a lot. <laughs> I, I guess my main message is there is still, even if you're on the applied side, there are many more ways by which phages kill bacteria. Uh, there is natural phage therapy, 
we can engineer phages as phage particles or, or display stuff. There's enzymes and the endolysins and, and the polymerases. These are known, but there's other enzymes. I mean, uh, Dornay's, uh, this is a uh, used uh, uh, drug that's, that's basically a DNA enzyme cutting up extracellular DNA in, in biofilms. So any nuclease encoded by the phage and, and other enzymes that are there that can an, have an antibacterial effect. So besides phages, those enzymes represent another layer. And then uh, what we thought, discussed today uh, towards small proteins or, or using those early phages, proteins as, as cargo as, or as inspiration for small molecules, it's all different layers. And, and it's just a matter of finding... Uh, new ways uh, that the phages can, can teach us uh, on how to kill uh, bugs. Well, I was going to ask you for that last question, but okay, this is even better. You <laughs> you had the message come out. Sabrina, you, you were going to mention something? Yeah, I was just curious about the industry side. Is there a lot of um, interest in developing these antimicrobials, or do they still think that bacteria are just going to resist them, and so yeah. maybe they're not yeah. investing in it? Now you touch on the main weakness of uh, what we've been talking about. So it's very nice to have this Iggy peptide, but again, going from this phage peptide and coming up with a molecule that mimics the phage protein yeah, that's again years of chemists and bioinformaticians and and and, and structural people coming up with peptidomimetics uh, of, of small molecules. So um, that that is the the biggest downside of of these uh, uh, phage proteins uh, to to inspire small molecules, only to end up indeed with a molecule for which resistance can emerge again uh, in the long term. Uh, the, the two arguments for it is that in any case, it's better than simply screening huge libraries of chemical molecules. That the interaction between the phage protein and, uh, or in this case, Iggy and the DNA gyrase, that's billions of years of coevolution of phages trying the optimal way and the optimal sites in the DNA gyrase to, to target. So having that interface, I think, is a much more valuable way to, uh, uh, yeah, to, to uh, exploit these, these antibacterial targets. In addition, uh, phages can reveal new targets, uh, the, the current antibiotics only targets a handful of uh, um, uh, bacterial metabolisms. Yeah, phages can have new uh, tar can reveal new targets, and, and I think that that's also an uh, important aspect in that regard. Hello. I am sorry. I was speaking yeah. with my mic muted. <laughs> Very interesting. Um, so uh, I think with that, we are close to the hour. Unless anybody else has other comments and questions, which I, I thought we could close with that sentence of let's explore more and be wary. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, uh, if, if that is, if anybody ha uh, anybody else has more questions, or else we can close because we're close to the top of the hour. Thank you, Gall. Every thank you, everybody. Thank you for coming back to Fate Fridays. We'll see you in next Fate Friday. Jean Paul, you were going to say something. No, that was my slow applause. <laughs> 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 oh you guys are amazing i love these um it was awesome to have you here rob thank you for joining us and thank you for talking about discovering and mining the phages the phage genomes for new genes which i find very very interesting um again thank you all so much for joining us 
this Fate Friday. We'll see you next Fate Friday. And I don't know if we have a topic already, do we? Not yet, no. <laughs> okay. Then we'll come up with something over the weekend. Please check out our, our social media. We'll post it there. Sabrina is the queen of social media, and she she'll post I'm not, things on no. her Twitter. <laughs> the, well, you're the mother of Fage, so that makes it so. <laughs> and okay. uh, we'll see you all next week. Thank you, Rob. Thank you so much for accepting our invitation. It was awesome having Bye. you over. Thank you. Sure thing. See you next week. Bye. Bye. See you next week.